Hey, it's Friday, and that means it's time for the next in our series, Fanzine Friday. Today we're taking a look at the Underworld Oracle number two from October of 1977. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer, and this is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, we take a fanzine off the shelf for a closer look. This week, that's the Underworld Oracle Number 2 by Lou Nisbet from October of 1977. If you haven't seen the series before, fanzines are magazines made by fans for fans of a particular hobby. In our case, that's RPGs with a focus on Dungeons & Dragons. These fanzines offer fascinating insight into the early days of our hobby. We hope you'll enjoy today's video. Okay, so we're back. Another episode of Fanzine Friday. As we do each week, we take a look at this uh, fanzine from my collection. We'll take a look at the cover, the table of contents, and some of the highlights from the uh, from this issue. This is the Underworld Oracle number two, heavy stock uh, paper, a uh, cover, heavy stock cover, regular paper with staples uh, holding it together. Here's the cover, uh, art from. Um, Phil Alexander, and I'm not entirely sure what is on the front of here. It looks like maybe it's an orc or a troll or some type of a monster. And then sneaking up behind him is, I'm pretty sure, a ninja, because that's one of the highlights of uh, this, this issue. Here's the editorial page. He talks a little bit again about their intentions to do a magazine that's like the Dungeoneer, that's really focused on uh, focused on Dungeons and Dragons. He does have a table of contents down here at the bottom, but I retyped it to make it a little clearer. Uh, and of course, he's encouraging people to um, to send stuff in. So here's the issue. As you can see, it's packed full of stuff. Uh, it's a little bigger in terms of page count than the Dungeoneer was. The first thing is the Ninja, which is a new class. Um, as he mentions there, uh, elsewhere in here, uh, while they were getting this one ready to go to publication, they realized a different ninja class had been created by someone in the Alarms and Excursions um, fanzine over in the USA. Uh, and of course, th the year following, there would appear a ninja NPC class in the Dragon Magazine. So it's the ninja is certainly one of the most popular classes or subclasses people have created. Um, Asgard Figures, which is highlighting Brian Anshell's um, company and some new figures suitable for D&D. The DMs Forum, which is a discussion for uh, referees. Uh, reviews, self-obvious, Illusions Ford, which is the new Magic Items section, new monsters, the Halls of Testing, which is the adventure for this magazine, and the Play Test, which talks about it. Um, Scribes Notes is really just their letters column, and in this case, that's really just a list of people who've written in with contact information if people want to try and reach out, connect to each other for purposes of gaming and so forth. Um, 3D D&D &D is a one-page article that's, uh, I guess, just sort of a little bit of, I don't know if it's fiction or what, talking about someone creating the ability to see your gaming table as a hologram, which is pretty close to the kind of thing we can do nowadays. So it's sort of interesting sometimes how fact follows fiction. Uh, Trolls is the um, cartoon that, or comic that appears each time. Uh, and then um, a corner of the dungeon, which is a little discussion about something you might do in terms of tricks, traps, and other things in your home campaign. Contributors are Lou Nisbet, uh, again, who's principally responsible for this, together with Phil Alexander, Phil, who does most of the illustrations. Uh, Hugh Kernahan submits one of the monsters, and then they say Alex Snedden is the person who actually draws the dungeon for the um, adventure that's in here. So here's the ninja class or subclass. They say it's sort of a combination between an assassin and a monk. Um, it's the typical thing you would expect. You know, they've got some unique weapons they can use drawn from um, ninja sort of history and stories, uh, as well as a number of special abilities. Um, but principally, you know, it talks about them as a class that would be um, one, try to keep its identity secret and its loyalty um, to its uh, the person who gives it its assignments and rules their particular group of ninjas a secret. If they're found out, um, they only have two choices, right? They can, they can kill themselves, they can kill the person who found out, or they have to, um, if they become publicized, then they have to give up their ninja abilities and just become essentially a fighter or an assassin or a thief. Have some thieving abilities. 
they have attacks with their weapons, they have attacks with their hands, and of course they have some special weapons they can use for things like climbing walls or claws that claws that help them climb walls and also can be used for combat. Um, quick draw on the sword, um, and again some unique weapons that aren't in a regular D and D campaign. Here's the article, which is essentially just a really um, encouraging people to go and buy these excellent new Asgard miniatures. And here's sort of a blown up picture of that. Um, lots of great ones there. They say the kind of things D&D people have been waiting for. Uh, my personal favorite, um, although a lot of them are great, my personal favorite is the owlbear that is right there uh, front and center uh, at the bottom. The, so the DMs forum I just thought was interesting because it talks about um, a number of different things that they suggest people probably should want to read. Um, it says obviously if you're starting out you should read the rule books. That's obvious. And remember this is white box or wood grain box era. Um, and then it says go read the strategic review, go read the Dragon Magazine, especially one through three because they have so much interesting content. Um, then of course the cross reference, go read all the Dungeoneer um, fanzines. Um, White Dwarf um, back issues, and they say those are all fantastic, which I would agree. We'll talk about White Dwarf at some point on a future video. And then a couple of fanzines he highlights there. Troll Crusher, which is Brian Anso, I believe, um, has a lot to do with that fanzine. News from Bree, which we, I think we may have mentioned briefly, was highlighted in one of the torchlights from, um, from the Dungeoneer. And Owl and Weasel, which was the fanzine that sort of precedes the, the White Dwarf. Um, so excellent um, options there. Here in the reviews, this time he talks about some books that you might want to read, which I thought I would be worth sharing, right? Dying Earth by Jack uh, Vance, um, The Incomplete Enchanter by L. Sprague de Camp, um, Sword of Shannara which is in, by Terry Brooks, which is interesting that that's his choice, not Lord of the Rings, but you know, I, I, like, I like both authors' books. Um, and then a couple I hadn't heard of, The Half Angels by Andrew Lovesy and The Dragon and the uh, the George by Gordon Dixon. Uh, and finally, The Dark Twin by Marion Campbell. So I haven't read those last few, but I thought I'd mention them here in case you guys are liking uh, reading fantasy fiction, sort of older fantasy fiction. Here's some examples contemporaneous uh, from the late 1970s. Okay, so the Illusion Forge is the new magic items. This time he focuses on illusionists. And he's got a couple of options here. The Illusion Mask, which is something, and all of which are themed, right, to go with Illusion. So the Illusion's Mask, Illusionist Mask, uh, is a copper mask you put on that once a day you can take the form of any particular person, face and voice that you, that you actually know. Um, an Illusionist Cloak, which allows the Illusionist to draw forth illusionary objects. It can be small things like coins or small weapons, a wand, some food, all of which are complete illusions and you know, can't do any damage, obviously food can't sustain you, et cetera, which can be used for purposes that they say, and just encouraging this idea of tricks and, and uh, clever use of illusion uh, for the character class. And finally, this uh, a magical rod that allows the illusionist to create a shadow version of himself, which it says can actually attack, do damage, and cast spells, which the way they explain it, if you can, and you can do more than one at once, so 10 charges can't be recharged, um, you could cast three all at the same time, and then each of those shadow versions of yourself can cast one of the spells you had memorized. So you could triple the number of spells you can cast by using this, uh, this rod. So clever possibility of usage there. Okay, let's talk about the monsters. Um, focus uh, here on some plants. Uh, the brain fungus, which is, um, sounds like a semi-intelligent type of, um, or I guess a high intelligence, it says, type of slime that falls on your head little tendrils dig into your brain and it can control you. Um, it'll, encourage, it'll encourage you somewhat friendly nature for a while until it gets to a stronger um, potential host and then it'll force you to, against your will, to go and fight and try and subdue that, not kill, but subdue the host so that it can either split or jump and get onto the other, um, what it perceives to be a stronger uh, creature. Um, and if you try to get the, if you can use charm plant to get it to leave uh, one of your party members, but if you try and pull it off by force, it can. Um, the person will fight to keep you from pulling it off by force, and if it's just ripped off by force, it can cause insanity of the uh, character who was infected. So, pretty nasty uh, thing to put in a dungeon. But again, great new monsters, right? Something your characters don't really know quite what it is. Then they've got some type of uh, f 
fungus spores called Curse of the Pharaoh. It says it'll be inside something that's airtight, so in type, of, in inside of a, a passageway that hasn't been opened in a long time, inside of a tomb. And it, when you open it, these spores sort of push out into your face, and you've got to make a save. There's a 75% chance you get infected with the disease, and if you do, it's essentially a poison disease, and it'll it'll begin to kill you unless you get clerical healing or magical healing. The Shade is a new type of undead. It's exactly what it says. It's incorporeal, it's evil, uh, and it just appears as a shadow along with the shadows of your party. It sort of moves along. It doesn't really attack um, directly, but what it will uh, try to do is essentially it has a magic jar type of attack um, to get into a party member's brain, take control, force you to fight um, briefly with the other party, and then it leaves. And so it does this to, because it says it likes to see the um, divisions form among the party and it'll go from one character to another. It says pretty much anyone other than maybe like a lawful good paladin or a lawful good cleric it would tend to shy away from. The pitcher plant is kind of another cool one, more spores. Uh, it'll shoot out these spores about 200 feet away. And it, it's cool, so if the spores hit you, you become invisible. They act as dust of disappearance. And it says later also, also you know, you can try to harvest those if you once you figure out what's going on. Um, but if you're actually hit and you're near the plant, then for some reason, you will be drawn invisible now, right? So your party can't see you and you'll try to climb into the mouth or the, you know, the center of the plant where it's full of acid to digest you. Uh, and apparently you can't resist that. It doesn't even say you get a spell. So, I mean, I would probably give, a, give my characters a spell, but um, that's not what they offer. Um, and here's a little bit closer view of the artwork on that one. And the last one, you may recognize this, the Eye of Fear and Flame. It appears in the Fiend Folio. Uh, and this one is the submission by Hugh um, Kernahan. And it says it just looks like a robed skeletal figure. You can't see the face. It wanders a dungeon. It may give your party instructions. If you refuse its instructions, then apparently it gets angry. It pulls its cloak back. You can see it's two different gemmed eyes, one of which is a constant um, fear spell, so you have to save against that. And the other one, every three turns, can shoot a, a 12 hit dice fireball. Pretty deadly attack. Um, so, pretty fearsome uh, a monster. And again, one that I think you'll recognize uh, from the Fiend Folio book. Here's the adventure. It's by Lou Nisbet. It's called The Halls of Testing. And they had this idea that in each um, issue there would be a hall of testing for a different character class. The first one here is for fighters. Fighters only, not multi-class, not other classes are allowed in. They say you put these things like on an island or a remote location. You find a group, in this case of monks, who say to the first level fighter, we'll let you go through this hall. Once you go in, you can't come back. The only way out is through or death. So that's pretty extreme. Um, but it's a, I think in particular the idea is if you had an individual player and you needed something to do, this would be a good thing to do. And it's also a good thing to do for someone who needs to catch up because if you do survive, they say, you know, you should get enough experience to go up a level or two. And so, um, again, something maybe like if you had a special situation, you want to let somebody start at first level, earn their experience points, but catch up, maybe the party's already at level two or level three. Again, they have the dungeon play test. Um, which is a great thing they have here where they give you a descriptive narrative of someone, in this case, you know, who does survive um, through there. Here's the, um, the comic for the trolls. I don't really understand this one. Uh, he says, I see some adventures coming. The guy asks him whether they have any magic users, whether they, there's a wall of fire involved. And um, then they decide to go and, I guess, hide. Um, and so he says, don't you prefer a quiet night in, I guess, as opposed to attacking. And then this guy's got the TV guide in his hand and he's like, yeah, let's go find something to watch. So the, I think the Muppets is what he references. So a little odd. Um, Corner of the Dungeon, Tricks and Traps. Again, the illusionist theme for this uh, issue. And this is Phil Alexander's article. And he's suggesting an, a concept for a dungeon where it's a bunch of identical square rooms the only person in there is an illusionist. So the, the whole fight would be the illusionist who has a secret series of tunnels um, where he can, and peepholes where he can look into each of the rooms and see the characters and as they go into each room, he'll cast some different illusion spell and just sort of torment them with illusions and, and until either they get killed, they give up and go away, or someone finally discovers that he's there and or that there's these secret passages, um, in which case you would obviously you know, have a chance to confront him and perhaps uh, win. And of course, they suggest you know he should have a. There should be a room. His his quarters. One of those rooms is his quarters, and he'll fight if you get there because that's where his 
good magic items are, I suppose. Okay, so that's it for the Underworld Oracle number two. Uh, another great piece of uh, you know classic old school um, D and D history with a lot of creative ideas and just a lot of fun to read through. Uh, hope you're enjoying these videos uh, in the series. Uh, and until next time, my friends, keep rolling twenties. Thank you.